this is a sort of last minute um, session yesterday and the days prior to this, this mini online conference, um, a few people asked us, you know, why, why don't we just address the elephant in the room and, uh, and discuss the effect that COVID is having on think tanks. Um, so we thought this might be an interesting opportunity to do so. Um, we at On Think Tanks are going to launch a small project trying to try and address this, asking, sending out a survey, um, you know, gathering con con uh, content from all of you. There's a weird sound. I wonder if, sorry. I think it's you, Leandro. It's, it's a sound coming from your from your end. I've just muted you for some for some reason. I don't know what it is, but it sounded very mechanic. Um, so we are we're going to be inviting um, our community, which is you, to send us accounts of how the crisis is affecting your organization, how it's affecting you um, or your staff, your peers, um, and hopefully later on we will be able to also do some research on what's happened in 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 the last you know in the last year to draw lessons for future crises. So. Um, uh, with that in mind, this is much of a, much of a mid, mid, mid to long term project. Um, we thought this would be a, a nice opportunity to get some of those accounts from the participants of this of this event. Um, and Hans wrote an article um, recently uh, for on, on think tanks. I'll share it in the in the chat option for those who haven't seen it. Um, and and Stephen has been reflecting on that as well. So I thought I'm ask you guys to start with some some framing ideas, some framing reflections on on how this might be affecting think tanks. And then I will open it up to anybody who wants to join in and and share some of these some of these uh, some of your own experiences um, in the way you see the effect the crisis is having on your organizations. So Hans, you wanna you wanna start? Sure, I'm happy to start. So I come to this from various directions. A uh, first direction is we looked a lot at think tank funding over the last few years. B, as I wrote to you in, in our conversation, my own experience of running CRC Georgia was very heavily influenced by two very big crises, one big internal crisis and a war. Um, and I felt it was very, very important to react to that. And my third experience has been working with a think tank, maybe the name is going to come up, I think there's probably Chatham House Rules or even more kind of confidential, where I got emails, where it's copied, I'm doing some strategy consulting for them, and it was copied into an email to the donors saying, all your projects will be delivered on time. And uh, not that much analysis about what was going on for that particular context as an economic think tank. Let me just show you very quickly a couple of key slides. I'm going to run through them very quickly. And... Uh, Bear with me uh, in terms of I hope that we will, uh, that I'll manage to get this to work out. If the software plays game, can you see my screen? Are you using um, um, Safari? No, Chrome. Oh, um, I can't see your screen now. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, well, alternatively, I'll just run through it in, in, in another way. You may have seen, you, since we're on so many channels, um, the, uh, okay, let me try this. Okay, can you see this now? Yes, we can. The Brookings revenue? Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, the, the funding side of it. Uh, and you kind of see here, this is, uh, we had done this analysis, as some of you may know, we had looked at, at 20 top think tanks in the US and had aggregated their funding. And you see this 2007. Um, and this is the kind of drop that they had. Yeah, in this case, it's a kind of, uh, now this choppy data a little bit because how you account for some of the kind of revenues is a little bit tricky but you see a 20 or 30% drop there, 20% drop um, more than, and if you look at the aggregate number, you have exactly the same. And why is this so incredibly serious at this point for think tanks? A, there's gonna be less government money. Uh, B, foundations, most of the foundations are in the financial markets in order to sustain themselves. So this is, uh, there's a few that have independent revenue, but this is gonna be a very big issue. 
and see there's going to be possibly a really quite nasty shift of policy priorities in kind of focusing on the domestic in classical donor countries. So I think there's something really, really potentially tricky to, uh, to happen. And I think delivering on your existing projects potentially isn't going to cut it uh, because you're because the, the, the scale of it is just kind of intense. And some of the key points that we have made, you will have seen, I, I'm not going to go through that now in great detail, but that we said, I mean, bringing core competence to it uh, at this point to, to these particular issues is, is really, really critical. Uh, the, um, in the, and I'm not entirely sure what I'm sharing. Maybe I'm sharing these, these particular things again. Um, but bringing core competence, really have an understanding of timing uh, and also not over-dramatizing. So I've seen this for the EU context, people saying, oh, clearly the EU is falling apart. Of course, there's a crisis. But this doesn't help if people come from the pundit side and say within a week, because there's a crisis, try and kind of say this is the end and, and the end is nigh. So anyway, uh, I'll almost leave it at that. You see my article, but I think this is a moment that could as we've said in the piece, could be extinction level event for a lot of organizations, I'm afraid. Uh, and I, I don't want to dramatize it with it, but I do think kind of swinging onto it, that's my own experience of trying to, of doing that twice with two crises, which at the time helped us and positioned us. But I think without that, uh, it's going to be tricky. Okay. Th so Stephen, over to you. Thank you, Hans. Stephen, do you want to add some reflections about this? I think you're muted. Um, I'm of two minds, yes. uh, as usual, uh, on these issues. Uh, at one level, um, there's always a tendency when you're hitting the depths of a crisis to think that things will go on as they are at the depths of the crisis and that there'll be no kind of bounce back to normality. Um, and I think there is a danger of, of too much catastrophic thinking uh, based on where we are now. On the other hand, um, there are some real, uh, if only financial challenges uh, facing uh, think tanks and other nonprofits. Uh, and I guess the Part of the problem is that government responses to this have sometimes been designed to be helpful to the firms in the country by providing them with liquidity, which can allow them to ride out the uh, interruption. But I'm not sure how how much that kind of assistance uh, will extend to the um, to the nonprofit, the NGO sector. Maybe a little, but probably not a lot. So, uh, and that of course varies from country to country. Some countries have been very aggressive in promising uh, financial um, lifelines to uh, the private sector. Uh, I don't think any, I don't know of a country that has a coherent policy yet on civil society. Maybe, maybe there isn't one, maybe there won't be one. Um, to some extent, uh, the experience may uh, depend on the attitude or the severity of the shock hitting the uh, nonprofit sector and its ability to withstand it may depend on the attitude of don't of uh, the philanthropic sector. Um, I guess there I th I don't have a lot of data. Maybe no one does yet. Uh, I, just two data points. Um, it's interesting, the Hewlett Foundation posted this morning a, a notice on its response uh, saying that it will continue its current level of spending and will increase it uh, in the next foreseeable future. So um, that's one foundation. It's only one, but it's a large one, which isn't letting the financial turmoil um, disrupt its um, its grant giving, which is a, a positive sign. And I think, uh, although it's not public knowledge, I think 
the Wellcome Trust is is another big UK, a very big UK foundation, has adopted the same policy. Um, they'll support their grantees by trying uh, to continue business as usual, at least in financial terms. Uh, so those are two kind of cheerful notes in an otherwise bleak um, scenario. Um, what was interesting about the discussion um, yesterday and the the case study that we had, which is a very, very interesting one, uh, was that uh, that case study focused on a number of kind of issues that went well beyond f kind of financial survival um, to um, deal with more operational matters. And I think those are worth considering as well. Uh, there is a sort of existential question. Will think tanks in general or will in this or that in particular think tank survive um, the uh, kind of having the whole global economic system put on pause for a while? Um, I don't know anybody knows the answer. Um, Hans is probably right to think that you, think tanks need to wake up and not just count on business as usual. Um, on the other hand, as I said, the the philanthropic community is probably um, far-sighted enough to realize that if they contract, they'll worsen problems among the grantees they're funding. So you could hope for some wisdom from that, that side of things, although maybe not from government sources. Um, so, but I do think it's interesting just to to widen the discussion beyond financial survival to, to um, operational issues, because those are important as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so before we open it up, and again, I insist, if you want to join in with video, just, um, just, just click on Start Participating. Um, I've set up a little tiny poll, which is the um, um, for the first question in a survey that we're going to be launching uh, soon. Um, and I'm just asking, what do you think um, the, um, what do you think will be the overall effect of the crisis on think tanks and policy research centers in your country? So not necessarily on, on your organization, but on, on think tanks in your, in your country. Um, and I, I've tried to, uh, a bit of a nuance in the, um, in the description of each um, answer, but I, I think it covers from, you know, you know, they will do well because this is an opportunity to them or, um, you know, they will suffer greatly. And as Hans has suggested, some of them may, may even have to close. So feel free to add your votes um, there. Um, now, in terms of, um, Hans, you, you just made a comment in, I missed one key bit. In my view, think tanks will be more needed than ever because we are in uncharted territory. I, I, I agree. And I think at this, this time is when think tanks um, can actually show their relevance and how important they are. I, I was having a conversation with the, one of the owners of a um, media group here in Peru. They run the, 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 the main news uh, radio. And um, she was calling me because she felt that um, think tanks in Peru were not doing enough to accompany the process with critical uh, thinking, critical assessments, and providing options or analysis. You know, they they were quite uh, quiet, relatively quiet, um, given the the nature of the of the crisis. And I think that's because many do not have the capacity to respond to crises like these in a way that will make them, uh, that, sh that will allow them to shine, right, and show how relevant they are in these circumstances. It has to do with funding. Um, they are increasingly dependent on government funding. So if you start criticizing the government now, you know, <laughs> that the little funding you have, you know, you might lose it completely. Um, and there's also, but there's also a, 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 a culture of, uh, of sort of avoiding too much critique. I don't, I don't know, we're very good at that. Um, but anyway, that's, that's um, I think there's, a, there's certainly a, a research, a, a capacity within the organization that needs to be, to be addressed. 
Um, um, so we would like to ask you questions about, we'd like you to, to share with us um, um, what, what do you think, uh, or what has been already uh, the impact uh, of this crisis on um, your governance, you know, the governance or the management of your organization? What has been the impact on staff, uh, their, their well-being, um, but also have you, have you had to lay off any people, uh, any staff, uh, permanent staff or temporary staff? You know, maybe a project has not come, um, has, has had to be canceled and you've had to, um, you, know, you know, say goodbye, unfortunately. Uh, on your finances, um, on your research agendas, you know, are they having to change? Do you feel under pressure that they, you know, to change them to address new interests um, and new priorities from funders? And on your communication strategies, how are you taking advantage of the situation, or are you finding that the plans you had have been derailed? Um, so I don't know. I just leave leave it open to anybody who wants to join in and and share share your experiences who would like to go otherwise i'll point it i'll point at someone ha, um, lucas great okay um well thank you very much for setting up this uh this breakout session and also thanks for your contribution hans and then Nikki on the ott block i have read them and i think it is a, a big crisis um but we shouldn't panic, as, as Stephen said. Uh, from Four Hours, maybe some of you, you know, our think tank, it's a rather unique grassroots model where we have 15 um, people on the payroll and the rest are hundreds of members who contribute to research and events. And going through the four categories you mentioned, Enrique, maybe on the financial side, fundraising, two observations. One is, at least in Switzerland, it's a there's a big flexibility when it comes to foundations. Uh, so they have contacted us saying, okay, uh, you can, we do core funding instead of project-based funding. So maybe this is actually a moment for, for foundations to realize core funding is better. Uh, you achieve more impact and results by core funding than project funding. So that's a little bit one of the hopes that I, uh, one of my mm. first takeaways. Uh, the second one is that there's a big activism. So many uh, foundations uh, uh, create now coronavirus funds and they want to uh, fund projects in that context, but they don't have uh, more uh, means maybe. So I'm expecting that in the second half of this year, they will say, listen, we have spent all our uh, budget for this year, no more projects. So it's, it's there, it's very time critical action in, in the, on the fundraising front to create new leads, but also a bit the dilemma, do I adjust projects where to suppose projects or activities in the context of coronavirus, or do I continue my other activities? So that's a bit of a challenge for us. Um, on the research agenda, I'm asking myself how, how, respons uh, how responsive or open like decision makers or our government will be on non coronavirus uh, related topics. Uh, so we have a full pipeline of publications. We already had to stop a publication on migration. Uh, so are we gonna launch this one uh, in June or later on? Is there's gonna be an interest for, for, for our classical topics on, on foreign policy? Or do we always have to bring in this coronavirus angle? Um, communications, I mean, there's a lot of communications out right now. Uh, we are also adopting our communication, bring in some, some uh, communication around the crisis, uh, have blogs on this and so on. Uh, but there's also a challenge, there's a lot, a lot of com communication going on. And on governance, uh, I see that my board has become more active, more operational. So they say, now you have to act, now you, you should do something. They, they, they are more on, on my team than usual. Uh, so also a sort of activism and for me to kind of as a director to find out or find this fine balance between getting active on fundraising on projects uh, on the response on uh, and business as usual kind of this question um, these are my thoughts or my experience so far in the past three weeks yeah. thank you um, seems encouraging um, anyone else Claire maybe you want to um, 
uh, we gave a short um, uh, introduction to our case yesterday in the session on uh, going digital during uh, COVID-19. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I can support many of the things that Lucas said. Um, so uh, funding right now, it's okay. We are looking at 2021. Um, we will see how um, uh, donors will adjust their um, priorities and also um, for us to see um, how, uh, and this is uh, very much connected to the research agendas, um, how we can also um, add uh, maybe new um, uh, projects uh, that cover uh, the corona crisis from a foreign policy perspective um, and to see what the countries that we normally cover and the regions, how they are reacting, can we um, provide um, an added value uh, to the debate right now um, uh, during this uh, this uh, crisis. And we also have the same problem that, um, that Lucas says, there are many important things going on in the shadow of the corona crisis. And it's uh, really also, I think, our task as a think tank to not lose sight of them, to keep no monitoring them. Um, I mean, we have this migration topic now at the EU-Turkish border and there are also many things happening now where probably people will take advantage that they're out of the limelight. So I think it's important to um, to keep monitoring them, and uh, but to see you know how how to communicate them in uh, uh, an online space where uh, there's just a total overload and focus only on this topic. So this is really a, a problem both for uh, research agendas and for communication. Um, and I think, but I could imagine that um, the more we get used to the current situation, you know, people will uh, uh, get uh, back to their usual interests um, as well and, you know, start reading up again on migration and economy and so on. Um, but of course, um, at the moment, it makes a lot of sense what also, Enrico, what you wrote in your paper to, you know, try to find an angle how to bring the current situation into our usual research topic, so not to ignore the elephant in the room in a way. Um, yeah, I think nothing nothing more important to add here. We didn't have to lay off staff as far as I know um, so far, um, but um, yeah, of course for the future, I think it's, uh, it's just a general funding question. And uh, for staff well-being, I think that was another question. Um, um, yeah, we are trying to stay in touch to have um, to see how we can also not maybe replicate, but maybe translate our social interaction from the, the office building um, to a virtual space. So we are a very, you know, localized uh, think tank in a way. We have a building where we have lots of events and we have um, um, everybody, you know, coming to work more or less every day. So it's really a big change for us now going digital and we are for example, we created, we are working on Microsoft Teams now, which we didn't do before. And we have like a virtual tea kitchen channel there. Right now, there's not much happening there. So I really wonder if this is a format that works for people to just, you know, open a channel like this. Um, and uh, we also have more, you know, emotional check-ins than usually, I guess, in our staff meetings, both on, on project level um, and on, on general staff meeting level to just have, you know, around and see how everyone is doing and also just invitations from management to, to you know, check on, check on your teams and, you know, get in touch and we are, we are available around the clock, basically. Um, and uh, everybody has a lot of understanding for uh, diverging work hours at the moment because people have to take care of kids. Um, at home and they might, you know, be more able to work at night than during the afternoon. So, yeah, there's, this is just what we try to do. Thank you, Claire. Um, Sonia, I saw you um, join in for a little bit. Um, are you still, are you still there? Um, what, what, what about the situation in Serbia? Um, can you say something about, um, about things, how things are affecting a think tank like BCSP, um, a relatively small think tank uh, with a very clear focus, or maybe other think tanks in Serbia. From what I remember, having spent a week there, visiting many um, many of the organizations I met were small. You know, they were you know they were running with a very very tight budget. Um, 
is you know do you already see have you talked to other to other people about the effect this is having on them uh, I think financially wise it's similar trend to what the colleagues from DGAP was talking um, most of donors were okay with ongoing projects so nobody is um, in problem for next few months or this year uh, the key concern is political situation not just in Serbia but in the region um, in some of the countries, like in Serbia, there was a state of emergency proclaimed um, by president, prime minister and speaker of parliament. Uh, they haven't involved the parliament under the excuse that it's a health risk. In a neighboring Montenegro, there was no state of emergency, but they, are, they prohibited people going out and they're pretending the, 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 uh, the context is as normal and organizing uh, public hearings on sensitive pieces of legislation. Um, so, I mean, what we see is closing of political space. This is the most difficult challenge that think tanks are facing. Um, A, because uh, you don't, um, you can't move around. Uh, there, is, there is censorship being uh, introduced either uh, through decrees, uh, you know, to fight disinformation um, there have been news of people being um, um, arrested because of uh, criticizing government, even in, in private communication, like Viber and so on. It's not really a Chinese uh, scenario, but uh, the space is getting closed uh, quite promptly. So I, I think that's the biggest challenge for think tanks is uh, to see what is when to react and on what issues to react. So far, most of organizations have focused literally on um, trying to react in relation to the basic principles of democracy. So explaining what is a proportional or not proportional, but in a very um, reserved <laughs> um, uh, way, not that much calling um, government directly for accountability as they would be in normal circumstances. So I think that's that's a trend um, that's going to stay most likely also after the formal introduction of uh, state of emergency um, and uh, in many of the countries in the region. So yeah, if I may just nominate quickly what I've proposed in our uh, coffee room, um, I think there is a big need uh, also for mental space, uh, like this conference, for people to just be able to reflect on what's going on and see the, the similarities and differences, and also think of the future uh, and consequences of what's ahead and how these problems could be um, addressed. And although many of the responses will be national or, you know, maybe by transnational organizations, I think think tanks can really, think tankers could really lead there. Um, and I see really a need um, for this transnational um, exchange of perspectives because it's, it's shocking how many similarities there are. Uh, for example, in an area that I follow, the use of military and police, um, but you can't find it at one place. Uh, you really, you know, nobody's connecting the dots and uh, seeing how the governments are learning from each other and also how you could learn from other civil society organizations that have been in a similar uh, situation. So, yeah, that's my contribution. Thank you, Sonia. You mentioned something about mental um, mental space, right? Sort of space to, to think. Um, and that sort of makes me think of something. I think having a few conversations with think tankers and what I notice is, or at least they they uh, report and confirm, is a is an in, it's a, it's a, it's a incredible drop in productivity. So um, mm. um, you know, men and women, possibly women far more, um, especially if you have children at home. Um, mm. Governments are are trying to. Um, uh, you know, uh, initiate uh, uh, remote uh, uh, lessons and, you know, online lessons when they were not ready before. And so they are having to spend a lot of time, you know, parents are having to spend a lot of time with their kids while they're at school. Yeah. Um, and then afterwards as well. And so they've had to put a lot of projects on hold. And as, as many of you have said, funders have been flexible and kind of 
and turning project funding into core funding, you know, sort of, so to speak, which is good. Um, but at the same time means that uh, maybe that, that is it in terms of the number of projects they'll be able to bring in uh, for the foreseeable future, right? Because we don't know how many of these um, uh, lockdowns we'll have over the next uh, few months, you know, if, if there's needs to, to go back, you know, go back to your homes and, um, and do some remote working and, and, and schooling. So there's, a, there's an element of loss of productivity. I wonder if you can, you can and Claire, you wanna join in, in a second, but uh, if you can attest to that. Um, and then the other point that was, uh, I wanted to make, and we can, we can leave that for a bit later, is that, um, so think tanks linked to universities that, um, that, are, that draw income from the tuition fees that students are paying. Um, at least in Peru, we already see that universities are getting really worried about a, a huge loss of income. There was already a trend of a decrease in enrollment in universities around, around the world. Um, and fees were coming down for many universities. Um, and I see that, in, I know that for a fact in Peru. Um, but um, with this crisis, many people are going to be unable to continue to pay their fees. They will probably withdraw. Um, in the South, the academic year is just about to begin, right? So they, they, are, they, they have time, they're at the right moment to say, I'm going, mm -hmm. to, I'm going to delay my entrance to university this year. Um, and this is going to have a huge uh, impact on the income of think tanks linked to universities or based universities. But let's let's move on to the productivity um, angle. Mm -hmm. Claire, you wanted to say something, I think. And again, mm -hmm. I invite anybody else who wants to join with video to to um, to join in. I, yeah, just to point, I think for productivity, and you you already um, uh, uh, gestured uh, to that. Um, I think it's very different for different people. People uh, experience the current situation in home office very differently. Um, that's what I've been hearing. So uh, some people, especially in the beginning, were like, oh, great. Now I have like so little um, um, uh, dates in my calendar and like no events in the evening, so much time to read. And like on Twitter, you know, all these like reading lists for Corona time proliferated because people, cool, now I can, like actually go back to reading good books and then other people are just totally overwhelmed and they have uh, I don't know like um, uh, our research director just said you know frankly it's like 50% of my time that's left for me now um, compared to before so um, yeah it, because of, of kids and, and other uh, uh, things to take care of at home um, so I think it's very uh, it's very important to be mindful how different the situation looks for different people and I also think that this effect of uh, feeling of having more time was also like very uh, uh, in the beginning only. And these people also keep having now um, uh, video calls back to back. So I think that was just a, a, a short effect in the beginning. And um, as to the funders, mm -hmm. I just wanted to add because somebody was mentioning Hewlett and um, uh, Welcome Trust in the beginning. So um, uh, uh, Bosch Foundation has been, I think, a little bit uh, slower, but they also um, inform their grantees that they will be their understanding of the situation. They are more flexible with uh, with funding. So, for example, if there are some um, deliverables that cannot be um, uh, carried out uh, due to the situation, then they, there is a possibility to even prolong the project beyond uh, the the project um, term uh, now, and also to shift. Um, uh, within the budget between different budget lines so um, this is a this is an idea and then of course there's the question and this is a uh, an individual uh, this has to be uh, discussed for every individual project um, if uh, prolonging the project term also means that um, the personnel um, budget can be um, um, can be extended because of course somebody has to be there to carry out the project next year, you know, if, if, if the project was supposed to end already. So um, so this is a thing that, that has to be discussed individually, but it is very good, I think, for grantees and think tanks to just know that their funder um, is, you know, flexible and understanding and, and open for, for uh, uh, discussion. Thank you, thank you, Claire. Hans? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I didn't mean to, the panic never gets you anything. That's why I'm tired of that. It's the seriousness of the situation. I mean, I... I... Ah, sorry, we can't hear you. We can't hear that well. 
You cannot. Okay. It's a bit muffled. Better now. Cannot hear you well. You cannot hear me well. You can hear me better now. I, we can hear you better now. Okay. No, I mean absolutely. You know, panic doesn't get you anything. But the but the, the problem, as I just wrote in the sidebar, uh, and I, I've I've worked for various reasons closer to the foundation side several times. Yeah, I mean TTI, we're relatively close to them. And sure, there's going to be the Gateses that uh, that do well out of um, people being more online. The pain, I think, realistically for think tanks is going to come in six to nine months. Yeah. So when the dividend payments go down, when I mean, it is very, very clear that this is what's happening in, in going to happen in a lot of places. Yeah. Since the governments will say, OK, we'll bail you out, but you're certainly not going to pay dividends to your shareholders. Uh, the, uh, and so, um, and, and for that reason, again, the, the, the point's not to panic, but the reason I think is there is that time for a pivot. And if you're in a, in a place where you have maybe direct foundation access, that's great. But there's practically no foundation that I'm aware of that has really sustained levels of regular income. There are Oxford colleges that own huge amounts of land where they will still, and Cambridge colleges that will expect those people to pay. But otherwise, almost all of that money, and again, I've looked at a lot of that money, it's typically uh, is capital markets linked in one way or the other. Yeah, it's, um, so that's why I think the crunch will come in, in six to nine months. And the good news is one has time in the meantime, but the bad news is that, that and I'm not so, so worried just about the public health side. I think that is manageable, but how we manage the economic side, nobody knows. Yeah, that's just the reality. Um, Sonia had her hand up first. But did you want to address something Hans said? Yeah, I, I just I agree. The financing is an issue, but um, I wanted to clarify uh, the point the point about mental space. Uh, it's related to what you personally in a new way of working, but it's also related to the organizational mental space to deal with, uh, uh, you know, forecasting, thinking of aftermath of Corona, uh, putting, analyzing the, the change environment. Um, so that's why I said, um, you know, I think it, it really, uh, we need cross-national um, communities to discuss these kind of issues. So to be ready, um, you know, to, see, to, to start thinking about it. And I was inspired with what Claire was presenting yesterday or how they set up a team within the organization to think of the processes. So not to, you know, do the tasks, but to think of the processes. And am I, I would propose that on Think Tanks be a host with maybe a number of us of these communities of practice on themes, on policy areas, where there is an interest between think tanks dealing with migration or you know uh, security or environment so i think it's, it's the people who are not directly affected or not managers responsible for 10 people uh, could take the task of providing this mental space for thinking and of aftermath consequences and how you think that's, that's, a, that's a good point and we'll 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 try to take it forward um, um and discuss with all of you of course um and see how we collaborate on this steven you wanted to uh, join in um, um i view my role here is to introduce optimistic uh perspectives uh but not to go too far and lull everyone into a false sense of security. But if I think about the discussions that we were having at our conference a year ago or two years ago about the post-truth world, you know, the fake news, the, the credibility of think tanks, it's surely the case that the experts who were so derided two years ago have now come back with a vengeance. Uh, that's so obviously the case in the UK and the US with politicians who spent a great deal of time over the past three or four or five years um, saying, uh, expressing their contempt for anyone who tr 
uh, had any expertise whatsoever, to see them flanked on the podium with the experts they insulted a few years ago and hiding behind those experts in terms of the tough decisions they had to make. And I, I think that's a, of course, they may go back to their old behavior when when times become something closer to normal. But that is a big change over two or three years ago, at least in, in the UK and the US, maybe not in other countries. Uh, these experts who were sent packing a few years ago as elite, out of touch, representing their own interests, uh, some of those experts are now making all the decisions about government policy in terms of public health, uh, and the government is is using them as a shield, uh, far from insulting them. So I think that's a big change. Now, the question is, at some level, that helps think tanks who are full of experts. Uh, so maybe it does come back to what Hans was saying, that there's an opportunity that has to be seized to be relevant. But in that sense, I think that is a, a positive. It's a horrible way to have achieved that positive step. But I think there's been a big change over the pa past month in the discourse of, of a certain kind of politician. So I think that's that's a positive in a... We may be in a world where there are not many positives, but I think that's one. Is this is this across the board, though? Um, I, you know, so I, I'll add a, 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 um, an account from from Peru. You know, uh, I, and I, I I follow the UK news. I've lived in the UK, so I follow the BBC. Uh, so the uh, the um, UK government's announcements, and I follow the Peruvian government's announcements, and. The, the Peruvian president is not flanked by experts, he's flanked by other ministers. And, and the ministers of, of the interior, defense, and the, the head of the armed forces get the same amount of time that the minister of health or the minister of education or the minister of finance are getting. Mm. And the numbers that we are presented with every day uh, are, of course, of the number of, of people you know, who've been infected, people who are dying, and also the number of people who've been arrested for not obeying the uh, lockdown and the curfew. So, um, and experts who have come on, come out, you know, online or on the media, um, questioning, you know, providing alternatives to the um, to the response has uh, have been challenged um, online, um, but also even challenged directly by the president for doing so publicly and not doing so in private. So not approaching the Minister of Health with their views in private rather than going you know, public with it. So I do feel that in some cases, uh, politicians are using evidence as a political tool, of course, and, and they're addressing that, that's true. But I wonder if this is going to be the same across the board and, and where, where experts in the UK or in Germany or might be, um, you know, their role might be revalued. Um, experts around the world might actually be forgotten even even further. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe just, Claire? Uh, yeah, just to, to sense on uh, this, I think this is a very interesting um, aspect. Um, and I've been observing this in Germany for the past couple of weeks. There is a very interesting development. We have like a couple, just like two or three virologists who have become superstars in Germany. And they have their own podcasts now. Everybody is like listening to science, you know, podcasts, which is, you know, these um, uh, super statistical um, concepts. I think this was mentioned on Monday in this session, like flatten the curve um, or exponential growth. Like everybody's like looking into these like global health. How do how do viruses spread and what what does flatten the curve actually mean? It has all entered a mainstream language. I think this is a very interesting aspect. One of those star virologists in Germany has actually, you know, people have said on Twitter like. Uh, shouldn't he become chancellor, you know, like it's really like people want them to take care of them because they feel they have answers to everything and I think uh, and they themselves struggle. So this this uh, specific one, for example, says I'm a scientist and I do not feel comfortable with uh, politicians hiding behind my scientific um, uh, uh, announcements because science itself doesn't have the answers and there is always a political choice to make. And I think that's so important that they say that 
and uh, and and I'm very grateful that they do because it's not you know it's totally left to them. They could also exploit the situation of sudden fame to you know just give whatever policy advice they want to have. But they're like at the moment, I think it's going very good direction. What I do see as problematic. And I think this is maybe something you wanted to hint to or, or were hinting to um, Enrique is the question of numbers. Like I totally disapprove of the way these numbers of how many new infections we have and how many uh, new um, uh, deaths and so on we have. It's, it's prime um, and center in daily news and it doesn't say anything because it's all dependent on testing policies in different countries, testing capacities, and it's totally misleading uh, to have countries that just say, oh, we have like zero cases or three cases. It doesn't say anything because it's just dependent on like how little they test. And I think it's, it's very misleading for the general public to use these numbers um, a lot. So I think there are two sides to this metal of like new relationship between expertise and, and and science, uh, expertise, and, and politics. Hans? We can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. You know, I mean, I, no, I agree with a lot of that was said, and Steve and I actually agree that this is also huge opportunities. And as again, as I wrote, I mean, you know, CRC, where Dustin now works, was very broadly, we were doing all sorts of things and writing reports, and then there was a crisis and we jumped for it. And that that ended up creating the surplus that allowed the office to, to the organization to buy an office. So there's a huge chance. Um, now, I just wonder, but, but then I look at think tanks that where I'm not sure that they, that the leadership connects and this gets back a little bit to the board engagement etc where the leadership is well set up to pivot into this time of crisis in the following way that the way that i think you actually need to act at this point is a little bit like a newspaper editor yeah who thinks exactly what story they're going to put in the in the center what the heading is going to be because it doesn't matter just what the research is on the inside but how it gets presented at this particular point in time and you have to ship fast and then how you integrate the, the, the knowledge that is in your team and that the people that have come up in these institutions are often great, yeah? but you also have people that are not necessarily capable of spotting or of, of generating the bottom-up debate where a kid sitting in the back, a kid, yeah, a 23-year-old, 24-year-old sitting in the back of the room has a good idea or a good objection and brings that out. Now, I think anyone who's read or followed on think tanks for a long time is just familiar with this and will think about things, okay, you know, this is a time where maybe you, you do want to talk to the board two or three times a week because you might likely are going to take a wrong turn at some point, almost certainly. That's that's part, that's part. what happened, happens in crisis. You will take one or two wrong turns, yeah? And that doesn't matter. That's okay, too. It's better than doing any, not doing anything. But if you do that mm -hmm. and you, your board is not behind you, then suddenly, depending on how, how important the board is for your organization, many it isn't, it's just your friends. But, so I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I agree that, that a lot of the stuff, sharing that is great, but you know, there's uh, hundreds of think tanks out there. There's, I can list on probably one and a half hands the, the, the think tanks that I know that should be on this session and that aren't. And that's what worries me. And again, I'm not even personally worried. You know, I, I work in agriculture. I'm fine. You know, we, we have orders for next year. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in my in my private business, but it's just the sector that I care about that that I that I'm really that and and the 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 the, the lack of people here. So the question is, I think it's one thing sharing this and so what Sonia talked about, but how how we make that accessible to a bigger community and reach out to that. I. That's something I, I'm not sure I have the answers to. Thank you. Um, that was, uh, and Stephen has added uh, a comment, this is the leadership stupid. I, we we at, at on think tanks have been arguing that, that governance and management and leadership is crucial for think tanks. And unfortunately, most, most organizations um, like, like, like OTT 
the the leaders don't get trained to be leaders, right? They just end up in a situation like this. And as you say, this is when they need the most the most help. Um, why why don't we um, why don't we look at something that might be a bit more positive for a bit um, and look at things that think tanks are doing to address address the um, the, the the crisis? Claire, you mentioned that you rolled out um, Microsoft. Um, Microsoft Space, I can remember the name of Teams, right? So, so you've got the capacity to do that. Lucas, you in the in the booth, um, you were talking about um, participating in a in a hackathon, um, kind of developing a new project based on your previous experience, based on having done this in the past. Um, you are developing something something new in collaboration with other organizations, right? I don't know if that's something you might want to share briefly and then maybe others who have examples of what the think tanks are doing can join can join in as well yeah i can i'm happy to to share a few uh, thoughts and experiences so um together with around five six other um organizations we built a core team in order in order to organize a hackathon this concept comes from the tech scene where you sit together for 48 hours or more and you develop a product that answers to a certain specific uh, question challenge. And uh, there's going to be the first online hackathon in Switzerland this weekend on Friday and Saturday. And uh, we are not only looking into tech solutions, so applications for, for challenges around the virus, but also um, uh, we want to develop on a policy level solutions to, to actually tackle some of the, the big uh, challenges. And this has become a huge uh, in initiative uh, in Switzerland. So there are over 100 organizations now part of this hackathon. Uh, yesterday night, over 1,000 people have signed up to build teams and to work on 120 challenges. And these challenges are from homeschooling, uh, work at home, but also um, challenges with a link to to, uh, international, to the international level, to, for example, how to lift travel bans uh, and so on. So also the post-crisis uh, phase. Um, they will be published tomorrow evening, uh, the challenges. You can sign up also until tomorrow evening. And um, it's one for us. It's interesting on the one hand to be part of that community who, who takes the lead on that. So to, to show that we are contributing in a in a in a concrete way also towards the government because it's hosted now this hackathon by the government. And on the other hand, to work on content that is relevant for us. So to bring in our own challenges. And I know a similar hackathon has been. Uh, um, already actually taken place in Germany 10 days ago and one in Poland, I think also two weeks ago. Uh, and it's for us, it's kind of a perfect fit because we can bring in our methodology, we can bring in our topics and we can actually contribute and be and have new contacts. And that's also interesting for us in terms of stakeholder management. I mean, we, are, we don't have any physical networking. Uh, yeah. Um, possibilities right now. You can talk to people over video who, who you have known before from before, but actually this virtual space and, and to get new contacts there, that's also one of the benefits for us. And we hope, of course, that there will be some good solutions, also sustainable solutions. And there is funding already in the height of half a million Swiss francs in order to actually support projects that come out of this hackathon. So you, it's this versus virus hackathon. The focus is Swiss, but there will be challenges on the international level. So if you want to participate as a coach, uh, as, as actually a thinker, or if you just want to take a grasp how it looks, you're most welcome. And it's a, quite a hectic uh, moment for us. So a lot of preparations, of course, but I'm happy to share also experience next week, maybe after the hackathon uh, on, on how it has worked, uh, but yeah. Great, thank you. Um, um, we'll be share. We'll share that link and um, and do yeah do share the lessons from from that experience. Uh, Stephen, you said you wanted to talk about what the what Box EU has done, which is an initiative from CPR. Um, I th do you want to? I think it might take in? too long. I'm happy to write it up. 
afterwards. I, I don't want to crowd out okay. other people. But, uh, it's quite a long story, quite an interesting one, very long though. And uh, it, it, it better that other people speak. I've had plenty of airtime today. <clears throat> I'll write it up. Um, okay, but uh, is there a headline that you can share? Like, is this a, is this a research project? Is this something internal? No, it's, is um, it, um... it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a testimony to the way that a network can respond more rapidly when it's properly led and motivated than an in-house research institute because it draws right. on a much wider range of people. And it also testifies to leadership because Vox EU was launched. It's the most influential economic policy portal in the world. It's just read everywhere among central bankers and finance department types. Very, very influential among that set of technocrats. It started, believe it or not, in the very month that the financial crisis in 2008 um, erupted, got all its readership because of the crisis, and played a big role in uh, influencing the G20 during the crisis and the EU. Now, I think it's, in a funny kind of way, it's been presented with another opportunity uh, with the uh, COVID-19, because the big problem right now is a combination of public health and economics. How do you keep people alive and not endanger, you know, the lives, of, especially of older people, but not let the uh, economy uh, disintegrate by waiting too long. And there, there's a really complicated balancing problem there of when you try to restart normal life uh, too, too soon and too many people die too late and a lot of businesses and jobs will disappear. And they've done a very good job of bringing economists together with epidemiologists to figure out schemes that nobody has the answer yet uh, of how to balance those two, um, two considerations. And in my view, that's what think tanks everywhere should be looking at at the moment. There are also civil liberty issues, civil liberties issues as well. Those are important uh, in terms of whether the emergency continues. But I think that's the number one problem for the next six months is how to restart economic life without endangering human life. And think tanks that have any expertise at all in this area should be focusing on that at the national level uh, as well as an international level. And I think it just points to leadership, good effective leadership and the ability to pivot as Hans was saying. And that's a, a structure that can pivot. Um, but other think tanks with in-house research staff have other advantages, but they need to pivot and, and address the really important issues that face them over the next six to 12 months. And that to me is one of the big ones. I think civil liberties is another one. That's a little bit longer term. Will we suddenly find ourselves much more boxed in by governments for ostensibly health reasons? Well, that's a story. I, it's a much longer story, but uh, I'm happy to write it up. But that's, it's possible to pivot and, and do good work. It's been done already. CPR has put out two books already on, on this issue, two full-length books in the space of three weeks. So it's possible. Mm. It can be done. It needs, it needs energy and management push and a sense of urgency. That's interesting. Um, We've also been collecting on Twitter, um, uh, and I've just added the um, the the um, the virus, the versus virus um, link to this list. We've collected, we've been collecting what other think tanks and organ research organizations have been doing. And I think one of the one of the interesting ones, and I, one of the, I think is very useful, is this is this tracker of policies around the world, not just the uh, the public health response, but also the complementary policies, because. Um, as I said before, many media outlets are finding it hard to be able to comment on or analyze what governments are doing because they don't they don't know what the alternatives are. Um, and so, if, if think tanks are doing this work, you know they are collecting you know all the policies and they're doing some of that analysis. That is certainly going to have um, a positive impact on the quality of the discussion um, at the public level, but also probably at the government level. Do you know of any, any other interesting initiatives that you might want to share 
um, and I'm reaching out to people on, on, online, on, on the chat. If you'd like to join us uh, with video, uh, please, please do. No? Another, so let me go back to something that I, I was going to say. I asked a little bit, uh, uh, a little while ago, I asked, some, I asked um, in the chat if there was somebody from Inasp on, on, the, on the session. Um, I know they were going to try to join in, but I don't know if they've been able to. But Inasp in the UK has been working on um, research systems um, and how equitable they are. And I think one of the interesting things about that is that, of course, not everybody has access to the the same. Um, uh, to, so not every not everybody has access to funders in the way that um, some organizations might. So and not everybody has access to to policy spaces in the same in the way that some organizations have. So I think one of the things that might be interesting to look at is how different think tanks will will fare um, in their countries or in regions. So some think tanks might, might benefit from more and more flexible uh, funding. But many others, uh, smaller ones, maybe uh, less popular, less well-known, uh, with fewer connections, uh, will struggle. So um, we, we may, I wonder if we may see some of, some of that happening. Think tanks not based in capital cities, think tanks um, who have been running on a very, very, very tight budget, um, we'll probably see it become more flexible, but they might not be getting more, more funding, right? The think tanks are, are unable to respond like CEPR has done or like Hans has been calling them to do, and, you know, and respond quickly uh, to make, them, make themselves quite relevant to new priorities. Might find that they will not lose funding that has been given to them already or promised to them, but they might not, might not gain more funding, win, win more money um, in the next few months, and th that will certainly be uh, a big challenge for them. So, so the equity of the research systems in different countries is likely to play a role in the survival of some of these organizations. Nice to see you there, Julie. Julie, do you want to do you want to join in? And you have a you've been I, I'm going to put you on the spot, but you until recently were working on the. On the think tank initiative and you've worked with a number of think tanks not just uh, around the world but also in latin america i wonder if you have any reflections on you know what you think might be you know what your expectation is of the health of many of those organizations you don't need to name names of course are you able to join us in the video or audio And there's a there's a there's a button a blue button that says start participating that you, you can uh, is it just participate button do you see it Hi. Yeah, you go. Can you hear me? Hi, Julie. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I was happily uh, curled up on my couch, kind of eavesdropping on the conversation. I didn't think I was going to be I'm sorry, coming yeah. in live. Hi, Hans. Hi, Stephen, Claire, Lucas. Um, thanks, Enrique. Um, so I, I only joined sort of partway in also, so I may have missed the, the beginning of, of the conversation. Um, but certainly one year since the Think Tank Initiative um, the grants to the 43 organizations in Africa, Latin America, and South Asia ended, my thoughts had already been on the think tanks. Uh, many of them who we were, we, it was quite uncertain. The future was uncertain towards the end of the grant period, how well they'd be faring. And now one year on, uh, especially on, with the dawn of the crisis, uh, my thoughts have really been with a number of these think tanks um, and hoping to reconnect uh, with many of them to find out how they're faring. I suspect that, uh, I, I really thought your point around uh, leadership and their ability to pivot and the need to kind of consult with their board uh, was, was bang on. Um, I think some of them will have been more nimble than others, but ironically, I worry that it's the ones that were already kind of better positioned 
um, to, to weather something like this that will be the most effective. Um, I'm thinking of, of actually a couple in Peru, and maybe Enrique, you can, you can share whether the Peruvian think tanks, in your opinion, have been able to kind of engage in and, and, and jump in on some of these issues in a timely fashion. Um, others in Africa, I honestly, I mean, it, it's just really the beginning of, of the crisis there, but uh, there are many, many in Africa that uh, both West Africa and East Africa um, that I'm concerned that we're so entrenched in the long-term cycle of research. This came up, I think, in one of the sessions yesterday as well, um, with, a, with a very defined research agenda and their ability to pivot and really for their board to even think strategically and, and, and be, able, be able to react um, in an effective way during these times is going to be rather limited. But there are some that I think will be quite effective in doing it. Um, it was neat to pull up the coat the Vox website right away, um, Stephen, and see see what they're doing, and maybe even pass that along to a few of the think tanks in parts of the world to say this is what a, a UK-based web um, think tank has actually been able to do, do very quickly. And so, and do you but do you and financially do you think that um, some of the organizations will will also um, struggle to get through the year? I mean, because project funding now, the funder cycles are going to be very much delayed unless projects were already underway. I think it'll just depend, Enrique, where they were at and what their um, pipeline looked like uh, in terms of whether they're going to be able to weather the next six to 12 months and beyond. Um, gosh, I have to admit, my thoughts, uh, aside from with my deep relationships with any of the think tanks from TTI, my immediate thoughts, Stephen, go to um, our, our dear partners over in uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, Enrique and Stephen and I have just uh, been working on an evaluation of a think tank in Papua New Guinea. Um, and I just spent two weeks there. I mean, Papua New Guinea is a very fragile democracy. I don't think you can even really call it that um, with one think tank uh, that's been functioning for 40 years. And it's just been limping along. And now I'm even wondering, now that the Australians have effectively pulled out of Papua New Guinea altogether after one of theirs was the one who actually brought the virus to Papua New Guinea, um, what's even happening there, given, again, dependency on one funder? Um, that's a big issue, obviously. If there's more diversity in funding and a mix of consulting, um, project funding, a lo some longer term, um, work. I think the ability to kind of weather this might be better, but for think tanks that are really, um, you know, rely on one funder, um, this is going to be really debilitating. I think the funders are going to be stepping up, but also when we think about a lot of the big foundations, uh, their, their endowments will have been hit quite significantly from this. I think of the think tank initiative and <laughs> how actually we, that program was initiated right, at, on, right before the 2008 financial crisis, but it was able to take advantage of a lot of the funding uh, windfalls actually from, from when the, the times were better prior to the 2008 crisis. Um, and then I also think of all the bilateral funders and how distracted now they're gonna be. This is a humanitarian kind of uh, reactionary time um, a lot of these, um, even thinking about work around evaluation, which I'm getting more into, around evaluation of organizations like think tanks or research programs, those will all be put on the back burner as bilaterals shift their emphasis, now their focus, um, to the more short-term, uh, more imperative work that's going to have to take place. So the long-term role that think tanks play will certainly be impacted across the board. Thank you for that, Julie. Uh, sorry for putting you um, on the spot. Um, I think it's a fair point you bring up um, in terms of um, think tanks in already very difficult contexts um, where their survival was, uh, was already in the balance and this is certainly going to affect them even more. And their loss will be a big loss to, to those contexts where there was just one or two organizations who were playing this um, dysfunction. Um, that will be very interesting to um, document and explore. Um, I think we are kind of running, 
<laughs> running out of uh, experiences to share or comments. Unless somebody else would like to join in, then maybe I, I'll try to wrap it up with, um, with some suggestions of, of next steps. Um, so completely, completely, um, so in parallel to this, we have, and I've shared, I've shared it already, but I'll share it again. We have put together a, what I think is a very brief response, but, um, I try to take some of our own advice. Um, I'm sharing the link here. So we're going to be running, as I said, a survey, um, we'll try to run it a few times in this year. So we see how things are progressing for some organizations. Um, we are going to be calling for um, articles, experiences. Uh, so do please share share this, and um, and and we'll be trying to also try to bring and convene uh, discussions. And I appreciate Lucas uh, your offer to help with that on Policy Kitchen. I think we maybe should talk about that. And of course, Claire, uh, others who suggested the 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 kind of bringing together of a community. Let's let's have that conversation so, to make sure that we we collaborate on on those things on those things. Mm -hmm. We are, we're not trying to sort of control the response, but certainly um, um, offer a, a place through which we might be able to access more, more resources um, over the next few months. Um, what we think is important, though, at, at, on think tanks is that um, you know, we should be looking at the COVID, COVID crisis and the response um, with an eye to draw lessons for future crises right? and make sure that if, um, you know, <laughs> I know this exactly exact crisis happens again, but certainly other crises. You know, the last one was not that long ago, as Hans has shown us um, in his um, in his tracking of, of of income for think tanks. Um, that we we are a little bit a uh, little bit better prepared, um, and how to become more resilient, um, like Claire has um, just mentioned. Um, you know, there will be shocks affecting think tanks all the time and and this might be an opportunity to to learn a little bit more so um please have a look at that at that that project website let us know what you think about it and let us know how you might want to participate and join us and and how we might be joining your initiatives as well claire you want to say something? yeah maybe uh if i if i may um draw your attention to this um uh quick project that we have been drawing up and that will start next week and uh because we've also received a lot of interest in uh, these different digital tools um, for um, uh, think tanks that might be used in uh, internal communications, but also to replace um, physical events online, um, but also how to um, uh, how to deal with uh, cybersecurity data protection online or new formats such as hackathons. So what we will do is uh, we will start a web event series next Thursday and um, I, I would be very happy if Enrique, if it was possible to maybe just uh, forward the invitation to everyone who, who was here and, and might be interested in joining us. So this is also a, a new thing that we will, we will join. We will team up with uh, Soapbox and OneComps at DJP, and uh, this will be in English. And we chose a time that hopefully works for, for many of you um, in, uh, or at least in, I, I think, uh, transatlantic terms um uh 5 p.m uh if, if if 4 p.m is better for for others we can also switch to 4 p.m um but uh yeah it should be more or less every thursday afternoon and um we uh, we want to tackle one topic at a time and we are looking for topics that might be helpful for you in the current situation so the header is um digital think thinking in times of covid 19 so if you have anything that might be helpful for you or good practices that you would like to share, any speakers or cases that we should look into, I'm very happy if you drop me a line and, and we will, you know, create the, the agenda as we go. Great. And do, do, do give us the, um, you know, you can, you can, we can register the events on our events calendar and then we'll, we'll, we, we can share this actively through our networks. And, and right. so that um, if people, if people arrive at our website, they will be easy, they will find your events quite, uh, quite easily. So um, don't, um, yeah, don't hesitate. I think that's, that's something I think we can certainly do at, at, at OTT is, is point people in the direction of the, of the right events and the right resources um, as, as well. Um, that, that would be our pleasure. Um, and Han, uh, so Lucas, do share with us um, what you guys are doing in these, in these projects. 
Um, all right, so let's uh, we'll keep it this. Yes, uh, we we you know we have we have some southern think tanks. Uh, we have fewer because of the format and the timings than I had expected for this this mini event. But this wasn't meant to be the the main event, and I think um, I'm encouraged. I've been encouraged by this platform, and I think we might we might give it a go um, uh, and do a repeat of the of this event. Um, um, you know, you know. So more frequent than I than I thought I we, we were going to maybe maybe in a month or two months we can all come together again and have a conversation around some of these issues and see how they're developing, and make sure that we do we do bring in a lot more think tankers from the global south. Yeah, it hasn't been as difficult as as I thought it would be, and there is a very good function in this platform that allows participants to create their own events. So um, if people are up to you know setting up their own events and convening the discussions, then I think that would be that would be great. Um, and I see some support for regularity. So I will take that take that up with my team. Um,